everyone and welcome. We're thrilled to have your family join us today for the Birchwood School of Hawken <laughs> Virtual Open House. I'm Linda Miares, the Director of Admission here at Birchwood. We're gonna start off the program today with a welcome from Hawken Head of School, Scott Looney, and Birchwood School of Hawken co-founders, Charles and Helene Debelad. Birchwood, uh, for an overview of academics at Birchwood and how our mission of equipping children to lead a life of becoming, growing, thriving, and flourishing through the development of intellect and character is a part of what we do each day. Afterwards, you'll have the opportunity to join informational sessions on early childhood education for preschool and kindergarten, <laughs> followed by an overview discussion with first through fourth and fifth through eighth grade teachers, and finally, Birchwood's signature programs in character development. All of the sessions will be recorded and made available to you after the event. Now I'd like to introduce you to Scott Looney, Hawken Head of School. Thank you, Linda. And thank you all for spending time with us this afternoon. I appreciate it. Uh, it is a pleasure for me to introduce the Deblacks who founded Birchwood School as uh, I've had great admiration for them for a very long time, but now consider them partners in ways that have been fun and rewarding and I think mutually beneficial. So about, little, about four and a half years ago, uh, Birchwood and Hawken merged into one school um, and the Birchwood School of Hawken um, was built off of a very simple premise, which is our original founding ideals, uh, not just rhymed, but they lined up beautifully. Um, as we started a conversation about this, it was very clear that if we both believe in centering things around the development of character and the deepening of intellect, making sure that kids were not only intellectually capable and powerful, but also had some obligation to go out in the world and, and do good things with that, um, that the rest would be details. Now, there were a lot of details, <laughs> but if that is the centering piece, and it has been, and we had a nice history, quite a few Birchwood graduates had gone off to Hawkins School, and <coughs> in that process, uh, we went back and looked and realized, wow, they had a remarkably successful track record um, at our upper school. So we said, well, why don't we invite all of them after they finish Birchwood to join our upper school? And along the way, uh, we added a second part of our high school, the Mastery School of Hawken just opened in University Circle. So now graduates of the Birchwood School of Hawken have two options automatically, as long as you successfully graduate eighth grade and have the endorsement of the DevX, um, you now have two high school options uh, to choose from. And, and in, in all cases, in all of our conversations as a team, um, we organize it around what, how do we help and support each other best to, for the development of this generation of kids? Um, and there are no two people I've ever met who I think do that more beautifully and with greater dedication than the Deb Black. So I'm gonna turn it over um, to uh, Chuck and Helene uh, to tell you a little bit more about the school and, and how the rest of the day is going. But, Thank you for joining us, and uh, we look forward to um, getting to know you in this process. We'll turn it over to Chuck. You're up, Chuck. Can I go ahead, Linda? Okay, all right. Well, thank you, Scott. We're kind of in a um, mutual admiration society. We're, we're very happy that we got to merge with Hawken, and there's been so much positive benefits going back and forth. It's been a, a tremendous move for us, um, for the school. So it's my job to give you a big picture of what Scott was talking about, how we're, we're alike. Some core elements of what undergirds everything that we do at school. I think that's important. Um, when we started the school, we sort of looked at our graduates, age 13, 14, 15 years old, having a certain kind of attitude toward life, certain kind of skills, certain kind of, of uh, um, approach. Um, one of wanting to grow. Wanting, they may not have the words of to flourish and to blossom and to thrive, but that's how they approach life. Their, their abilities are going to vary, um, and we cannot predict that. We can't push them in certain kind of lines, but we could do something to foster that attitude toward life. Enthusiastic and confident about learning and continuing their learning. Um, focused on developing whatever skills and talents and potentials that they have and also inspired uh, morally and ethically to become the very best person that they can and to be a contributor to their world, whether it's family or something broader than that. Um, we, we wanted to create that, that that's the way they would look at life. 
So when we envision the school, um, elementary and middle school, what we're thinking of is, is, is to cultivate and create momentum. Yes, we're gonna cover the same things any elementary and middle school does, but underneath it, you're creating momentum because this way of life of growing is not something you attain at age 15 or 25 or 35 or 45. It is an approach to life. And so we wanted to put, in addition to traditional topics that you cover in school, undergirding them would be this attitude toward life. So we created momentum intellectually. You remember uh, Scott mentioned these two words. We develop the becoming life based on the intellect and the character. Intellectually, we put children on pathways of academic success in very challenging and rigorous standards that builds confidence and it builds self-worth. So they're not afraid to try things. As they go forward, they've had experience of success and they know how to reach success. We develop strong work habits. Um, focus, habit forming in terms of setting goals, building intellectual stamina, time management, and um, organizational skills, all the things that if they are habits, they contribute to a life of growing when they get older. And rich experiences in the classroom. I think most people envision education as sort of a uh, dumping information in first grade, then you dump information in second grade, then you dump information in third grade, children allegedly learn it and respond back on a test. Well, you can't say there isn't something to that, but they need to be engaged experientially in the subject matter. So if you're teaching writing, they got to write on a regular basis. If you're teaching reading, you wanna cultivate avid readers in, introduced to a broad range of literature. If you're going to train mathematicians, yep, they need to know their facts but they need to problem solve. And the same is true about science. They need to cultivate their curiosity, their questioning, their wondering about things. And, and similar with social studies, with history, learning how to take the lessons of history and apply them to their lives and apply them to the way they're living in their society today. Of course, there is the mastery of knowledge. We, we completely agree with that. And I think the record of our students and their attainments speak to our insistence that you learn stuff. You, you don't just do experiential things, but you learn stuff. Then secondly, we want to create momentum um, to become a good person. Even desire that when I grow up, I wanna be a good person. I wanna have good character. Now we're a secular school, um, but we still frame it around what I think is universally, would be universally acceptable. The Aristotelian natural virtues courage, self-control, compassion, justice, humility, gratitude, and wisdom. Um, we sow these kinds of thoughts and ideas into children via stories. Every morning for 15 minutes, they hear stories about great men, great women from history, um, but also common people that we pick up in the newspaper or in their family. And we teach them to pay attention to the beauties of human living things that were people have done that are courageous or compassionate or just because what stories do is they're like seeds that get planted into their mind and into their heart. Now it's not like math where you can give, teach them something and then ask them to spit it back. That's not how you cultivate moral growth. You sow seeds. And these stories, these pictures speak to them long into the future. I still have students who come back and say, I remember the story you told us in the eighth grade. Uh, stories have an impact on the children. And then the second pet, uh, piece of creating momentum is building up habits. Um, you, you cannot yell at somebody when they're 13 and 14 and tell them you need to work hard. Well, it's a little bit late. If they haven't learned that in earlier stages, incrementally, we're not going to load down a kindergartner or a first grader with work, but little by little, you, you learn what it is to work hard, to be disciplined, how to fail, how to be disappointed, and how to overcome it. So that little by little, the moral growth is something that they desire, they long for, and make it a part of their living as they head forward in life. Well, that's the big picture. And um, the rest of the teachers, with my beautiful wife being the next person, will fill in all the details of our program. Thanks again for coming. Thank you, Mr. Debelak. 
uh, and Mr. Looney. Uh, now we will hear from Helene Debelak. She is our Director of Curriculum at Birchwood. Uh, Mrs. Debelak will speak about another key aspect of our curriculum that trains children for the future. So hi, and um, <clears throat> forgive my scratchy throat. <laughs> Um, so yes, you will hear from the teachers how we put this mission that uh, Chuck and Scott talked about into the different subject areas. Uh, but I just want to tell you a little bit that alongside each of the subjects, a separate but key thread woven through our curriculum from preschool through eighth grade is creative problem solving. Throughout our life as adults, we have to manage change and deal successfully with complex open-ended challenges. So in the early years, we have to equip children how to unlock their innate creativity by teaching creative problem solving. Creative thinking skills are cultivated in specific ways. We have intentionally designed problem solving courses at every grade level. In the, um, sorry, get my notes here. Yeah, so in preschool and kindergarten, we have what's called loose parts play. Children study a concrete object such as sticks or buttons and through play and engagement with various forms and types of the object, they make connections with other knowledge they possess and begin to create new pathways of understanding. These are the hallmarks of creative thinking and problem solving. In grades one through four, there's a weekly extended class period called creative problem solving. Taught alternately by science or social studies teachers, students engage in hands-on or real life problems and then learn the classic six step creative problem solving method to tackle and solve a problem. So science teachers may present a problem such as to figure out how to build bridge out of a given set of materials. Social studies teachers lead third and fourth graders in conducting our school-wide Harvest for Hunger campaign. And the problem they tackle is how many ways can we get people to donate? Uh, fifth grade, we have a weekly class in which they extend these skills to action-based problem solving, training students with creative thinking skills and applying them in the school or outside or whatever imaginative uh, imaginative ways those teachers can devise. In sixth to eighth grades, all of these skills of creative problem solving are applied to an international program called future problem solving. In this program, students engage in solving real world problems in a variety of topics such as food waste, human environmental interactions and mission to Mars. They are given four of these throughout the year and they spend several weeks researching the topics and then work in teams of four to identify challenges and work through the creative problem solving steps to arrive at solutions. Hand in hand with creative thinking is critical thinking. If children aren't taught to be critical thinkers, they won't know as adults how to be open-minded, consider multiple perspectives and weigh and balance ideas. So this is a snapshot for you of critical thinking and creative problem solving at Birchwood. So welcome, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon. We did have a couple questions from attendees that came. Uh, one specifically uh, for um, Mr. and Mrs. D would be, how is the Birchwood uh, approach to gifted education distinctive from other schools? I know you talked a little bit about it in your introduction, yeah. um, specifically with gifted students. Yeah, I can, I can address that both from uh, the standpoint of what we do as compared to uh, where that field is at today. Um, and I think some of the latest writings and what we have practiced now for about 10 years is what we call a talent development model. It's, it's to try to come as close as you can to the uh, mentor-apprentice model. In other words, uh, 
the label gifted is just way too broad and it means too many different things. So when we talk about somebody, let's just call them high intelligence, hesitant to use the word, overly use the word gifted. High intelligence, well, high intelligence in what? Where are their strengths? Where are their weaknesses? In what ways do that they need to be addressed? So it really requires some attention by a teacher or teachers to figure out where children are at, where they can go, and to find ceilings. I know I have a, a little boy in my, um, in my math class now. It took me nearly a half a year to figure out his ceiling. He was so brilliant. So I could have easily done what a typical program does, is just move him a year ahead. But that's not talent development. Turns out he was three years ahead. Now I'm having trouble keeping up with him, just giving him enough information uh, to learn and to study. So talent development values that individual, finding out what, what capacities they have and just how far you can take them in, in, in learning. Now we're a small school, small classrooms. Helene and I both have backgrounds in the field of gifted education. So, you know, we work together with the teachers on figuring that out. And a lot of times, you know, I hope I don't offend anybody, but sometimes these highly gifted kids can be a little peculiar. And so your first take on them is, man, this kid is easy. They're a problem kid or he's not very smart. And if you don't take the time to dig and recognize the potential that's in the child, then you miss it. And you can write them off as not being as intelligent as they are. So in summary, it's a highly individual thing that you've got to pay attention to for all the children. And I would add to this, and, and Scott and I are in agreement on this, in a certain way, um, we need to do that with all the children. Finding out what their potential is and allowing to them to go as far as they can. So of course, with high intelligence, well, by golly, they should be doing things two, three, four years ahead of their, their level. But the satisfaction will come also to a child who maybe doesn't have that kind of level of intelligence, but they're given the material to excel to their capacity. And in either case, the children will be very content with who they are because you've brought them to the, their highest level of achievement. I, I can just add. Wrong. Oh, I can just add a little bit to that. Um, you know, I mentioned creative problem solving and critical thinking, and those are not just for gifted kids. Those are for, you know, every child, but we had to learn our stuff, right? We had to take courses in those things. We had to research the development of how, how that's taught and attained by, by children. So that's, that's the part, that, that's, our, that's where our background is. But all our teachers are trained in these things so that um, they're infused into every subject matter and every teacher has an understanding and is equipped to reach each child uh, wherever they are and with these creative and critical thinking skills. both and, and Mr. Looney and for this wonderful welcome and introduction to Birchwood. Um, we're, at this time though, we'd ask everyone to please, we're gonna leave this session and return to the main webinar page. Uh, you'll be able to launch the next session, which is early childhood education at 2.30 PM. And again, all the sessions will be recorded and made available after the event today. And to let you know, applications are being accepted for the 2021-2020 school year uh, right now and more information and the link to the online application can be found under admissions on our school website. So thank you uh, all and we'll see you at 2.30. Good afternoon.